While many of us are content to see the Irish pub in a foreign city as the extent of the Irish presence abroad, maybe now it's time to put down the pint and look at the bigger picture. In 1890, Argentina was booming and Buenos Aires was in the middle of an immigration surge that would see the city go from a population of 200,000 in 1880 to 1.5 million by 1915. The Argentinian government advertised for immigrants and 50,000 Irish people, mainly from Westmeath, Longford and Wexford, answered the call. In February 1889, the SS Dresden left Cove with 2,000 emigrants on board. Three weeks later, it docked here. This was the single largest batch of emigrants of any nation ever to arrive in Argentina. So, Juan Pablo, tell me about your great-grandfather. He arrived here? Yes, he arrived uh, in 1889. Um, his name was uh, James Pierce. He was from Westmeath, and he came here in the Dresden, SS Dresden steamship. Um, just, yes. just to here? Yes. Now, how many people are we talking about? Uh, about 1,800 people. All Irish? Yes, all Irish. And that was the largest batch uh, number of immigrants ever come to Argentina. So, JP, what did your great-grandfather, James Pierce, do when he came to Argentina? Uh, he started working in the railroad. There were 240,000 kilometers of rails. Here in Argentina? Yes, here in Argentina. And the Irish built them? Many Irish built them. The, the railroad are like the, were like the, almost the blood of Argentina. Yes, <laughs> yes. The Irish impact on Argentina can be seen everywhere. Che Guevara's father, whose mother was a lynch from Galway, famously said, in my son's veins flows the blood of Irish rebels. The pioneering Irish flourished, even establishing an Irish colony 700 kilometers south of Buenos Aires. And up until the 1950s, the Irish had their own distinct areas in all of Argentina's major cities. Today, 500,000 Argentinians, or 12% of the population, are of Irish descent. They are our fifth largest diaspora. For years, we've dined out on the diaspora. They're part of our story that the Irish were victims. We were a small tribe, and we were scattered to the four corners of the globe. But now that's no longer the case. Ireland is no longer a victim nation. We are rich, and the next big idea should be to take responsibility for the diaspora, not only because it's the right thing to do, but because culturally, and more importantly, economically, it is the only unique option that we have. In a world of sameness, it is the diaspora that make Ireland and the Irish story different. <laughs> In 2002, a group of young Argentinians with Irish great-grandparents turned up at our embassy in Buenos Aires. They wanted to get passports. Despite the fact that they considered themselves Irish, were educated by Irish nuns and priests, and wanted to come back home as pioneer immigrants with a spiritual attachment to the country, their applications were rejected. These people are our history. They want to come home, yet modern Ireland turns its back on them. Peter, tell us about the Highland family. Where are you from? Well, uh, it's different parts from Ireland, really. Uh, from Westmeath, uh, from Malingar, from Kilkenny. My four grandparents, they, were, they, were came, they came just from, from Ireland, no? All four of them? Yes. And Maura, you're, you're from Wexford originally. My, the Murphy family came from Wexford and the Parsons family came from Dublin. And do you feel Argentinian? 
If they ask me if I'm Argentinian, I will say, well, unfortunately, yes. <laughs> unfortunately, why? I feel that this country doesn't offer us what we think we deserve. The only good things I can see of Argentina is that university is free, and besides that, no. <laughs> really? Yeah. Daniel, tell me, tell me about the O'Brien family. The O'Briens came from County Cork, from the area between Liz Carroll and Botevant. When was the first time you were aware of being Irish? When I was a kid, my mother used to tell me, we are Irish, you are Irish. Well, when, when you think of a possible future in Ireland, what would it be for you? Well, I would like to go there with my girlfriend, Peggy Martin, and we would like to have a family there. Getting an Irish passport has eh, never been easy, as it's been very easy for people living in Argentina if your grandfather was Spanish or Italian. It would be great to get an Irish passport, for sure, to do working experience in Ireland or, and to interchange business, no? Yep. Argentina is a, a huge country, has huge opportunities, and I think uh, Ireland should start uh, looking down, uh, down South America, no? To develop uh, here with the Irish community, a big business, no? Tell me more, would you emigrate to Ireland? If, if, you, if you were to get a passport, would you, would you live there? Yes, I would like to live there for five or six years or even my whole life because I always felt that I was from an English-speaking country. Here in Argentina, I don't feel like I belong here. not to question our present immigration policy. Because these are the people who flew the flag for Ireland. These are people who feel Irish. They want to come home. And yet, what do we do, despite the fact that they sent emigrants' remittances home for years and years when we hadn't have been? Now that we've got money, we give them the cold shoulder. While it is quite clear what we could do for them, what could they do for us? Other diasporas around the world constantly enhance the economic interests of the homeland. In Southeast Asia, the Chinese diaspora use Chinese Singapore for their banking, and the Indian diaspora in Silicon Valley use Bombay for its computer manufacturing. We too could tap the commercial power of our diaspora. These are the generational echo of our past, and they could well be the soft power of our future. And it is not just the old diaspora. The new contacts that we have made are also invaluable. We are now playing a global game and networks with the rest of the world will be crucial. These Chinese graduates, who most of us only meet serving us in SPA, all attended the Athlone Institute of Technology. They have formed an alumni and are eager to maintain links between Ireland and China. The resource of Chinese students studying in Ireland is something we underestimate. We give them student visas, but once they're finished college, we kick them out. Here we have China, the fastest growing country in the world, the biggest country in the world, the most population. You look around Shanghai, it's, it's like New York in Asia. <laughs> Yeah. And we don't seem to understand that, that the Chinese students in Dublin and in Ireland in general mm. are a fantastic resource yeah. for both China and Ireland. Yeah. I mean, do you see it that way? I do, I do. I think so. I was talking to an Irish friend one time and he said it was, it's very smart for Irish company to hire Chinese students who have Irish education and who stayed in Ireland and understand Irish culture so well. And they came back to China, they have Chinese and they... Um, are from this country locally. So he said that would be a very clever idea to do this, but not many companies are doing this now. What is the ideal job for somebody who's worked in Ireland? Probably to work for an Irish company that has connection, business connection with Asia, or best would be with China. So we could be uh, most useful to the firm, and the firm would appreciate our background in Ireland and also um, our Chinese background as well. 
While our government may be slow to recognise this new potential, Irish individuals are out doing what they've always done best, embracing the globe and exploring new frontiers. I came in October of 97, so I'll be here 10 years this October. And originally to work in O'Malley's Irish pub, which is the first Irish pub to open in China, so curiosity brought me here to see an Irish pub in China. Loads of opportunities here, definitely. Uh, and again, it's making the right contacts, if anything. The country uh, opens to the world more. So uh, we get to see, in the Western people come to China, we get to see different things, uh, people doing different, doing things different way, and thinking different way. And, and I think Shanghai is very easy to adapt to uh, different cultures. They've got this outside world now all of a sudden, and they're, it's just completely changed. It's, it's, just, it, it's hard to get over the mind, specifically seeing Shanghai the way it has changed. Really, it has. First, I was just watching them. Yeah, Andrea got me to play. Then she got another American girl play. Now she's that captain, Catherine. And yeah, the last two years, the club been growing very fast. This GAA club is only four years old. The Irish community here is growing, and it will be interesting to see where it's going to be in 20 years' time. Ken Carroll has been living in China for 13 years and has a successful chain of language schools, as well as ChinaPod, a podcast business teaching Mandarin. We came here, I think it was January 94. We kind of liked it. Uh, spent the first seven years struggling because we were too early, perhaps, into China. Um, How did you crack it? Because you, your website now and your, 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 your podcast yeah. is the biggest downloaded podcast in the world or the uh, second it's, biggest? It's one of the biggest. It's, it's, we're doing well. I mean, our business is, is after... Well, I've been 13 years here, so, you know, we, we've, we've gotten the hang of it, let's say. Yeah. There's no stopping this. The, the China is the workshop of the world. It's, it's going to happen. But what you're doing is you're taking Chinese technology... Yes. You're marrying it with a global interest in China. Yes. And you're using Irish brains to yes. sell it. Yes. I, I believe an entrepreneurial society like Ireland, we're a little bit sleepy at times, we're a little bit comfortable at the moment, but I think it's individual entrepreneurs who will drive the, the thing forward. Seeing opportunities, taking it responsibility for themselves, as I say, not necessarily needing gobs of money in order to start a company, and just going out and doing it. I wouldn't now, having lived in a, in a sort of communist socialist society, I have I've low expectations from government, <laughs> to be honest with you. Ken's right, governments don't deliver anymore. In the past, big countries dominated. Today, small countries can flourish. In the 1970s, Ireland needed capital. Now we need people. Capital is everywhere. Ideas and networks are scarce. We may not be as big as China, but we are much bigger than we think. The Irish have always been a globalised tribe. We've not always been a globalised state. We rarely feel foreign in any country for very long. We've gone out there when other countries have actually isolated themselves. The borderless world that globalisation offers is going to mean that we are extremely well placed to benefit in the coming decades. Creativity gives a country a competitive edge. Creative thinkers are the ultimate soft power exponents. Joyce, arguably our most creative mind, saw no contradiction between the artist and the entrepreneur. He saw that a fine business brain is as creative, irreverent and alert as a fine artistic mind. Declan, we talk about uh, the relationship that's sometimes overlooked. 
that Joyce himself was a businessman. I think that Joyce believed, as most exponents of the Irish revival a century ago did, that there was a link between cultural self-confidence and economic success. His very first appearance was in a magazine devoted to industrial enterprise. Um, in fact, his stories appeared alongside the week's manure prices, and he was rather embarrassed by this. And that's why he invented the pen name Stephen Dedalus, so that the august name Joyce wouldn't appear beside the weekly prices for horseshit. Um, but it is a very interesting beginning to that career. For years and years, I've been hearing that the artist Joyce and the entrepreneur Joyce, the man who brought the Volta Cinema here, are at loggerheads. Well, I wouldn't see them as enemies at all. I mean, Joyce was a futurist. He saw the future and how it might work, to coin and quote and remodel a phrase. And I think that he saw that cinema was going to be a huge thing for a people who love narrative, who love stories. But, but he knew, as he said, there was a city with 500,000 people and no cinema. And that was the way business people talked, I suppose, at the time. I think it's fascinating, if you look at his great book, Ulysses, that it actually climaxes in a meeting between a poet and a small businessman. Uh, and so at the climax, Bloom asks Stephen, the young poet and intellectual, back home with him. And, and Bloom says, look, there is no difference between those who make their livings by the labour of their bodies and by the labour of their brains. Joyce makes this the climactic moment of his great book. How do you think, as an economy, we can galvanise the soft power of Ireland, or even the Irish tribe outside of Ireland? I think it's already happening in a way. You know, there's a sense in which the whole of 19th century Irish historical debate and cultural That's aspiration kind of accelerated has suddenly been turned into a global debate. We have certain things in common with the Germans, the Italians, and especially with the Eastern European peoples after the Soviet Empire. We can exploit all these connections. I mean, Indians have named streets after our political and literary figures. Um, they're only waiting for us to arrive. They already know about us. Business flourishes in societies when people are free to think up new ideas, question authority, and look at the world from a different angle. In contrast, countries that foster begrudgers stifle artistic spirit and entrepreneurial flair. Globalization demands that a country promotes these non-conformists. If we want to play the game, we need to start young, and we need to teach our children to think rather than learn. Ireland's future is hidden in our past. Our economic success in the 21st century will be greatly enhanced by the demographic echo of the 19th century and the wandering Irish who left this country. Almighty God, we ask your blessing on this land we love. Grant strength and wisdom especially to the President, Taoiseach and all who bear the responsibility of guiding and governing our nation. Joyce's hero, Leopold Bloom, was a member of that other great wandering tribe who have been mining the resource of its diaspora very successfully for the last 50 years. No matter what your view of Israeli politics, it is clear that the country would be nothing without its diaspora. Yankee, explain to me the relationship between Israel and the Jewish population around the world. Being Jewish, unlike some other religions, is not just a faith thing. It's an identity thing. It's a people thing. So being a member of the Jewish faith, without Israel, it doesn't make sense. Israel is part of being a member of the tribe, if you like. By and large, the Jews have been dispersed for 2,000 years. Don't forget that until 1948, there was only a diaspora. We've been pushed around, we've been kicked around, murdered, pogroms, never ever able to say, this is our country. Yes, because there's a dot inside, so it becomes blah. Sha, sha. Uh, almost, sha, ba, sha. Yeah, uh, dot, dot, dot. Sha, ba, bash. Look at it, look at it. Sha, ba, sha, bash. Sha, that's ba. right, that's right. The last time I was in Israel, I, I noticed a huge amount of buses with a little thing called a place called home, and the buses were, you know, from Alabama, Tennessee, Argentina, yeah. Manchester, yeah. I presume Dublin. They were Jewish kids from the diaspora, which either the Israeli state had paid for or somebody had paid to come and kind of recharge their Jewishness mm -hmm. in Israel. Yeah, there is a very active um, uh, desire now to acquaint young Jews outside Israel who don't know enough about the country 
to come experience, see for themselves, and probably creating their own emotional bond. What do you think Israel gains from this idea in terms of brain power, in terms of networks? Well, there's no doubt that educationally-wise, the fact that Israel opens its doors to all Jews has been an incredible boon. It works two ways. Israel gains that way, and people look at Israel, look at its um, uh, achievements, and feel, you know what, I could be doing what I'm doing here, there. We already have our own version of the kibbutz that we call the Geltok, where we too could be recharging the Irishness of the diaspora's children. Like hundreds of thousands of other Irish children, I spent summers in the Gaeltacht, learning Irish, hurling and folly limni. The Gaeltacht served to remind us of our Gaelic heritage. We had a language that could be spoken, a culture that was vibrant, and most of all, we had a common history. Now many people argue it was a jaundiced, nationalist and limited view, but so too is the story of any nation. So just as years ago I was sent here to Balangeri to learn Irish, we could do exactly the same with the children of the diaspora. We could bring them home. Now what this would do, it would infuse them with a sense of Irishness. And in return, we could tell them that we value them. Now economically, although this might not necessarily lead to emigration back to Ireland, what it would do, it would make the connection strong and it would give us access to the soft power that is their brains all around the world. Reinventing Ireland for the 21st century won't happen on its own. In terms of concrete steps, we should extend Irish citizenship to the diaspora and give them the right to return. In Ireland, I think you see something of what is so great about the United States. And I must say that in the United States, through millions of your sons and daughters and cousins, 25 million, in fact, you see something of what is great about Ireland. Irish America is a huge reservoir of talent, yet JFK, the most famous Irish American of them all, wouldn't even qualify for an Irish passport. This is economic lunacy. Conan O'Brien is typical Irish American. He was the writer for The Simpsons and now hosts one of the highest rating chat shows on NBC. My mother's side of the family is from Kerry. My father's side is from Dungarvan uh, by the water. And uh, we both, both sides came here before the Civil War. So we've been here a long time. I am still 100% Irish because Everybody moved into central Massachusetts, farm country, and m married other Irish Catholics. And this has been going on for generations, 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 generations. So I'm dangerously inbred. <laughs> I went to Ireland uh, for the first time, I want to say about 12 years ago. I was very visually aware that, oh my God, I fit in. I could grab a shovel, stand by the side of the road, put a, put a cloth cap on my head, and... <clears throat> completely blend in no one would ever no one would ever ask any questions well you've got the look you know i've got the look i uh, i burn in about about eight seconds so the times that i've gone back to ireland immediately my body there's a biological response which is every cell in my body says yes you know the narrative like of the irish americans and the irish in britain and even the irish in argentina is a sort of a victim one i was of course i was born in 1963 and as 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 you all know john f kennedy he changed everything. So I grew up in a very liberal s school system. Uh, you know, no one cared that you were Irish. But my grandmother would still pull me aside on St. Patrick's Day and say, now, the, okay, you're, today the Protestants will taunt you and they're going to wear orange shirts and they're going to put chalk in your milk. And, you know, and did, I, was, I was, no. Did, did American <laughs> Protestants wear orange shirts? No, no one knew what the hell that was all about. In a nice way, I mean, it, it, it should be that way about everything. It should you know, uh, we should be so lucky that it's that way about race and religion just across the board. If the Irish government were to say, 
to every Irish American kid that you could come to Ireland to kind of recharge your Irishness when you're 15, 16, 17. Would you think Irish Americans would take that and, and move with it? I love that idea. It'd be fantastic. No, and, uh, and no sunblock. The emotional attachment of many third and fourth generation Irish American corporate executives contributed greatly to the build up of multinationals and our boom in the past 20 years. Don Kyo was the president of Coca Cola and the founder of the Kyo Institute of Irish Studies at Notre Dame University. Neil O'Dowd is the editor of the Irish Voice. Both are prominent promoters of Irish American. For generations, we've seen emigration out of Ireland into the United States and elsewhere. But now what are we seeing? We're seeing immigration back in. That's built into every generation of Irish. The people that are here, the third and the fourth generation. It's inside of people. It's, it's inside of... I've traveled all over the world. And the minute somebody would find out I had an Irish connection and a Notre Dame connection, I found myself talking about the Irishness instead of about the, what I was there to sell, a little bottle of Coca-Cola. So that, uh, that the whole concept of Irishness is built into the DNA of every single person who has Irish in their blood. Is there a deep yearning on the, in, the, in the soul of the Irish American to make this connection? Absolutely, and I think, I think that, that Neil O'Dowd opened the door with the creation of Irish America as a concept, uh, opened the door for that to happen. Many people, Don, would argue that Ireland doesn't use the diaspora as we should. Its greatest asset outside of its own children is, is the diaspora, and uh, it should link into that in the future. When you sent millions of people out from Ireland, like we did, in the famine and, and the aftermath of the famine, that they grew up with a definition of Irishness that we in Ireland did not know anything about. And that definition of Irishness is central to the Irish diaspora. I think the key element is that Ireland has to take the leadership in this. Only Ireland can lead the diaspora. The diaspora is waiting for Ireland to take this initiative. Oh, will you please play? Will you please play? Just this one game. Hina. That was like mice again. Jay Hina. Jay Hina. Jay Saher. Jay Saher. Jay Downey. Jay Downey. And now we're going to say the month. Downey. Nolly! That wasn't very good, well, just... Siobhan and Sean are both Irish Americans and members of the NYPD. Like the Lithuanians in Dublin and the Jewish kids in Rathgar, here in Manhattan, this family see their identity as crucial and are passing it on to their six children. It's difficult to conceive of Irishness without considering the diaspora. And yet many thousands of us homegrown Irish were kind of disparaging about their bona fides. We kind of call them plastic paddies and we're not really, really that sure whether or not they're totally authentic. But this is an extremely narrow view of Irishness. And given our history, it would seem entirely illogical to suggest that the beginning and the end of the Irish story has been the establishment of the 26th County Republic. Arguably, the Republic is only a phase in our history, a phase that was probably appropriate years ago when we were worried about Britain and sovereignty and kind of getting our own act together. But all that is now over. Sean, tell us about the, you know, you're both cops, okay? This is the traditional image of Irish Americans. Why, why are the Irish Americans still so represented in the cops? I know it was, it was a decent job. And uh, I don't know, I think I was well suited for it. I loved it. I had a great time doing it. And I covered uh, the, pretty much Manhattan and parts of Brooklyn. And I was in units that covered the whole city a few times. When, you, when you're talking to your mates, and let's say you're talking to Italian mates or Jewish mates or whatever, when they ask you, what, what's your connection to Ireland? What do you say? It's my heritage, it's my parents, and it's my ch children. But did you live in an Irish area? No, my parents were brilliant. They gave us Gaelic names and they made us grow up in a black neighborhood, sent us to Jewish schools, so they isolated us. <laughs> so we had a yearning to meet up with another person that, of Irish heritage, and better yet, an Irish person from the other side who, know, who knows how to pronounce my name. And do you think it's changed, Siobhan? Do you think it's changed now? 
that yes. Irish Americans are now thinking, hmm, I'm more interested in that country than maybe 20 years ago. There's an interest in the language, the dancing. There's an interest in going over now. It's cool to be Celtic. But would you, to emigrate to Ireland? I to would live? love to. To live. I Siobhan would love, would to. love to. I, I would you know love what? to. My family is here and my, I, my roots are here. I'd sell in a heartbeat. Really? Siobhan, how would you like your children here, behind us, to relate to Ireland and Irishness? In a similar way that I had growing up, home. Do you know how the Jews have such the affinity for Israel? Let it, Arnold be the Mecca. You have to go back. When we authentic Irish listen to Americans talking about where their grandparents came from or their great-grandparents, we sometimes don't realize what exactly it is these people are trying to express. These people are just homesick. They need a place, they need somewhere to belong. Now, for the first time in centuries, we in Ireland can give them that spiritual sense that they yearn, while at the same time, we can use their brain power to expand Irish commercial interests all around the globe. Now, if you think about it, this is a perfect fusion. We could use them by coming back to create the best economy in Europe, if not in the world. So what we would be doing is something very simple. We would be saving their soul while they would be building our future. By offering passports to people of Irish descent, we could complete the historical cycle where a rich, confident Ireland looks after the children of those who were forced into exile. Their knowledge of foreign markets, along with their emotional attachment to the homeland, is a perfect fusion, offering us capacity, talent and networks. We could become more global and more Irish at the same time. This hits the sweet spot where the demands of the market state align themselves with the foundations of the nation state. Ireland would turn itself into a global talent hub of soft power and the tribe into the largest sales force in the world. There is nothing particularly new about this generational idea. Our constitution states that the Irish nation cherishes its special affinity with people of Irish ancestry living abroad who share its cultural identity and heritage. Let's make that special affinity a reality by giving the exiles a chance to contribute to Ireland's regeneration. Now, if we put our minds to it, the 21st century could easily be the Irish century because globalization allows us for the first time ever to put our arms around the diaspora and transcend the limitations of geography. Now for years, Irish exiles all over the world reminded us of our economic failures back here at home. But now all that has changed. They are our only unique resource. And all we have to do here is have the courage to reimagine Ireland where the country is the mothership and the global Irish tribe is the nation.